Hi, I'm Peter Rollett. And I'm Katie Steckles. And Peter, what is today's mathematical object? Today's mathematical object is one of those that may not sound entirely mathematical. It is a book. Right. And, um, you know, there are books about maths, there are books that are not about maths, so there are links between maths and literature. And so we have an expert to speak about that. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you. My name's Sarah Hart. I'm a professor of mathematics and I've just written a book which is about books as well. So a double, double hit there. Good. What's the title of your book? So it's called Once Upon a Prime, The Wondrous Connections Between Mathematics and Literature. Very good. Yes. Already. I, yeah, we've got I a like pun it. in the title. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's strong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is because obviously books and maths have many different sort of interfaces. Uh, and the the thing that immediately springs to mind when I think about books and maths is is like those terrifying yellow Springer textbooks, <laughs> yeah. and you know the the idea that that often pe- when people write books about maths they do so entirely ignorant of what the audience reading the book is going to yes. need to know, yes. uh, and just kind of include whatever they think, and uh, you get these kind of really quite dry and impenetrable textbooks sometimes. But obviously, equally, people write excellent books about maths, and a lot of popular maths books are really nice and readable. But I think it's it's possibly broader than that, right? Because the, the book that you've written is about maths in books as well. Yes. Works of fiction, poetry, this this kind of thing. So I agree. Yeah, the, the Springer textbook is not one of the <laughs> one of the things I talk about <laughs> in Once Upon a Prime. Although I've had that experience. I'm sure many uh, people have when you you pick up a book about a thing you're a mathematical area you want to know about and it says you know this requires only the most basic knowledge of homological <laughs> algebra and you're like oh no i'm already lost yeah. so okay that's one experience of mathematics in books but what i'm really interested in and focusing on is the mathematics that's there in literature so in fiction in poetry in writing more generally and there are kind of three ways that mathematics can appear And I talk about all of them. So the first one is structure. So there's structure in any kind of writing. There will be some sort of structure. I mean, even words themselves, words are made of letters and you make words then you have sentences and then maybe you have paragraphs and chapters. So you've got this kind of hierarchy. It's a bit like points and lines and planes. And at any point in that, any stage, you can make a decision about whether you're going to impose an additional constraint. So perhaps if you're writing poetry, you know, the sonnet form of, of that the mm. we all will know. Then there's a certain number of lines. There's a rhyme scheme. So there's additional structure that you can add in. It's there in poetry, but even in places you wouldn't think to see mathematics, in, in novels, in works of fiction, there are ways that structure is already there, but there's also additional structures that people can add in. So that's kind of the first way that yeah. mathematics it, appears. I think it's, it's quite nice because it, like until you actually start writing and thinking about what you're writing seriously, you maybe don't even notice this, but as a reader, yeah. it will affect you. So like yeah. really short sentences are quite impactful and you can kind of play with that and use it to to kind of make a point or make emphasis on things. Uh, but then if all of your sentences are quite short, it just becomes really weird yeah. and, and yeah. kind of boring. And that, like this is the thing we found with writing um, that like sometimes if you go go back through something and look at how long each sentence is, you want it to vary a bit, like you want yeah. short ones and long ones in there because it feels a bit more natural, I guess, in the way that you read it. And you can use a long sentence to sort of take someone on a journey somewhere and then a short sentence to like throw something in their face or whatever. It's, it's really interesting because like language as a thing is sort of evolved and, you know, the way that people talk to each other and write things down. Yeah. But actually you can use that as a tool, yes. I guess. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you see that, in literature, but, I mean, even more broadly, in when people give speeches or something, yeah, there are all these kind of flourishes of language. As you say, a short sentence, one syllable words, maybe things said three times. That's another thing, you mm. know, where numbers come in. Re- yeah. Repetitions, saying things three times, three three word sentences. Those are all kind of part of the 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 the, the rule book, the playbook of of writing and making arguments. And so they're, they're there in, in, you know, all kinds of writing and in 
the way we speak. And as you say, you can just throw in a, a short sentence every so often. Yeah, I mean, it's deeply enjoyable to me, If since we're already going quite meta here, yeah. that three word sentences is a three word sentence. Yes. <laughs> you just kind of threw in there as a clause. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the more meta, the better. That's my, that's my motto. <laughs> So, so this is rhetoric, right? This this thing about getting yourself across and using all these tricks to emphasise what you're saying. Is that rhetoric? Yeah, I guess that's what you would call it. And and authors, you know, even if even if they're not writing a kind of non-fiction rhetorical thing, in fiction, of course, the way you structure your writing is absolutely important to, to what you're doing. And you will make different choices based on different scenarios so you've got the kind of at one extreme you've got poetry you know and, and the extreme extreme haiku uh, you have mm. 17 17 sounds or syllables to get across that message and that's kind of really precise numerical constraint which you know it doesn't stop you being creative and this is one of the points i i love to make just as with mathematics mathematics is a really creative thing just because there are you know axioms and rules that doesn't stop you that that actually enhances your creativity because you're working with something you're not just in the void <laughs> and and it's the same thing with poetry having poetic constraints deciding to write a sonnet or a villanelle or a haiku does not stop you being creative it's the opposite of that it it actually encourages and inspires creativity yeah well this is the thing we always say about mathematics it's about understanding the rules well enough to break them yeah right? yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, and you can play. So, you know, maybe you start off with Euclidean geometry and you play around with those and you've got this beautiful playground that you can prove Pythagoras' theorem and all sorts of other things. But then, you know, at some point in that development, you go, well, what would happen if this rule wasn't true? What happens if I break something and then, oh my goodness, a whole new world opens up? Or what happens if I add in something else or just tweak things? And then you get just wonderful exciting worlds to play in yeah it's the same with literature if you yeah if you don't know the rules you can't break the rules <laughs> <laughs> and i feel like the 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 constrained but things like haikus you definitely know you're doing it right yeah. the, some yeah. of the other stuff you're talking about i think people kind of do it intuitively based on having read a bunch of stuff yeah. And then they speak in threes and they, you know, they do some of the, they do this repetition and things like that, mm. but they're not necessarily. And it's making me think of this whole, you know, is a footballer doing a quadratic equation when they <laughs> take a free kick? You know, there's a bit <laughs> yeah. of that, isn't there? That Some of it is just, it's it, obviously it, it involves that structure, but you aren't necessarily aware of it, particularly as a native speaker of the language. Yes, that's that's exactly right. And th we could say the same things about art. You know, we, we as mathematicians, we might, with our mathematicians, I notice symmetry and be able to understand, you know, what what has been done in a technical way. It doesn't mean the artist has necessarily done that consciously. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. The same with writing. I mean, if you think about things that have developed over time through through, you know, being transmitted orally, like fairy tales and folk tales the kind of structures that develop around those there's a, there's a rhythm to them there's a pattern to them you kind of know the, the the young hero will go on a quest of some kind and you can sort of feel there's this pleasing and soothing familiarity to the way those stories go but mm. you know there wasn't a committee of fairy tales that sat down <laughs> you know in whenever and said right well all fairy tales will feature uh three things happening and all there will be seven of this and 12 of that there wasn't there wasn't that decision made consciously, but it sort of evolved. So there, that's the kind of uh, mixture, mm. I think, between, yeah, a conscious choice and then not conscious. And then somehow you're the thing where you fit into a, a tradition, which is partially yeah. conscious. And I'm often I mean, some of that is fairy tales. Some of it comes out of ancient, uh, myths, doesn't it? Greek yeah. myths and so yeah. forth. And uh, yeah. I'm often talking to students about this because I teach a history of maths module. And there's a tendency to try and fit historical facts into a, because these are the narratives that you naturally fit into. Yes, so it's that yes. that thing where because you're you're naturally using the rule of three without realizing it, you're yeah. also naturally using the 
downtrodden hero overcoming yes. the adversity in society or <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, so you then yeah. fit that to the story that you're telling yeah. about this this or that mathematician. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've, I've sort of vaguely heard that there are actually only a small number of actual stories and that everything else is just kind of dressing up around. Like, it's, it's, I think there's seven. So, well, of course, seven, or, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, of course it's seven. And that's that itself is a story. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but it's funny you can you can think about you know the, the the narrative arc of a story and there's this really fun lecture you can find online by Kurt Vonnegut and he gets he's got this blackboard and he draws here's the graphs of various stories and so his the axes that he has got are time moving along and then um, happiness level of the protagonist so right. you know you've got boy meets girl right he draws so and that one kind of boy starts off kind of happy they're fine then they see this you know they fall in love they become extremely happy because they're in love but then of course there's a setback and the graph goes down plunging below the axis but then mm. everything works out so you can draw the graphs of that and the funniest one he finished his his little disquisition on the on the graphs of stories uh with metamorphosis by franz kafka in which Gregor Samsa begins the story incredibly miserable <laughs> and becomes even more miserable until you know he dies. So yay, well done, Kafka. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that sort of cuts out to zero and goes to minus infinity. So you know there there are there are graphs you can draw um, in a, it's kind of fun way. But there are also other ways you can look at narrative and narrative structure and and really get some genuine mathematical uh, ideas out of it, which you know. It's, it's quite fun. Structure. Do you want to? You mentioned poems. Should we talk about rhyming patterns? Yeah. So there's some really cool things that can come out of uh, rhyme schemes. So with with lots of poetic forms. So I mentioned the sonnet. Um, in a sonnet, there are 14 lines, and in the English version anyway of a sonnet, uh, you get so a rhyme scheme tells you which lines rhyme with others. So the first four lines of a sonnet, there the rhyme scheme of that we'd write it as A B A B because lines one and three rhyme with each other. The A lines rhyme and the B lines rhyme, and then it goes C D C D, uh, E F E F, and then a rhyming couplet at the end G G. Right. So that tells you this is the constraint you've got for yourself. Here is my rhyme scheme, and then you know off you go and create. Uh, but so there are lots of questions you can ask mathematically if you think about. Just say uh, a quatrain, four lines uh, poem, which is generally what children will come up with. If you ask a child to write a poem, they'll probably give you a quatrain. So there are, there are different rhyme schemes you can choose for a quatrain. A, B, A, B is one of them. But you could, I mean, you could have a really perhaps too constrained. You could go A, 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 A and make everything rhyme or maybe none of the rhyme. And then, you know, is it even a poem at this point? But then in between that, I mean, you could do a calculation, you can write it down. What are the possibilities for four lines? And you can count them up and, oh, gosh, what is it? Maybe it's 15. <laughs> I have to check. Um, but but this is a calculation you can do. But as so often with these combinatorial things, if you want to try and find a general formula for how many possible rhyme schemes there are for a four line, five line, N line poem, then, then it becomes very difficult to do. And that kind of there isn't a formula. It's one of those ones where there should be a general formula and there isn't. There's no closed formula. Um, mm. So these are, these are called the bell numbers nowadays, these numbers for how... And so rhyme schemes are not the only place you find them, but it's sort of how many ways you can group together a collection of things. So in this case, lines of a poem, if there are five lines, and you can go all the way from all of them rhyming to none of them rhyming, uh, and so, yeah, the, the number of combinations mm -hmm. goes up really fast and, and it, they crop up in different places. So in, in Japan, uh, in medieval Japan, these numbers were studied not because of poetry, but because of a game, a kind of a parlor game that, the, that they would play. You know, middle class uh, people would play. They'd have a dinner party and they would do they would have five uh, incense sticks with different kind of scents to them. And the hostess would choose, some of them might be the same as the others. And so she, you'd, go, you'd have one and two and three and then four and then five. And then you'd have to work out which ones were, had been the same. So was the first smell the same as the fourth smell? And so, you know, then, so this is this parlor game and how many different possible 
combinations of smells could there be? And so I think it's 52, right? Um, but this was one of these bell numbers. And because of that, they got interested in these, these, these things that link up with rhyme schemes in poetry and lots of other situations. It's, it's quite fun. And so these numbers were known in Japan and, you know, up to quite high, uh, high values of N had been calculated and known long before we started to think about them in the West. So it's just a kind of an interesting way mm. that it all ties up just from thinking about poetry and, and even how many rhyme schemes there are. That's one yeah. of those brilliant ways that mathematics is in different things and it's yeah, the same piece yeah. of mathematics. You can see the structure behind it. It's brilliant. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's, it literally just reminded me of another very, very similar thing, which is because I've just been doing Fibonacci sequences with uh, some of my students. Yeah. And there, there's a really nice thing about, um, I think it's like the puzzle of uh, if you're going to walk up a staircase and you can either take one or two steps at a time, how many different ways to walk up the staircase. Yes. And it turns out like some of the first people studying Fibonacci numbers were effectively poets in India yeah, yeah. Um, who were, they have this uh, particular type of poetry where you can have like a long or a short syllable yeah yeah and then it's like if you if your poem line is this many syllables long how many different ways can you combine one and two syllable noises i guess yeah um, and you literally just get the fibonacci numbers out as like for a given length it's the nth fibonacci number yeah um but actually that's really cool that, that this was a, a piece of maths that came out of this entirely unrelated question a completely reasonable question to ask you know how many different possibilities are there for this yeah um i mean i, I love the mindset of someone who rather than just going i've got this creative form i'm going to use it to produce a piece of art they're just like right how many possible yes <laughs> pieces of art could i create here well exactly um, I, yeah um I love that. So, so yeah, the, the there you're talking about metre, so where you put the stresses and, and, and long or short patterns. So I think it's lagu and guru and lagu is long and guru is short. Um, and it, it, yeah, in, if you're talking about like in, in Western poetry, in English language, the corresponding question isn't doesn't give you as interesting a sequence because it gives you powers of two because you can either, you know, where are you putting your stresses? And then it's like iambic mm -hmm. pentameters or whatever. So uh, stress or no stress, that's like two choices for each syllable. And so if there's an N syllables, there's two to the N possibilities. But yeah, this this Indian poetic form where you're talking about long and short, and that's kind of your version of the stresses. Fibonacci numbers, it's lovely that they come out. And I think, yeah, so it's it's just lovely to see bits of mathematics just quite naturally arising from from the poetic forms and structures that mm. are already there and trying to understand them. And, and so one thing you, you sort of say about, yeah, it's kind of cool that we can we can analyse that and count them. And then the, the question that might come back is, yeah, OK, you're, you're, you mathematicians are having fun <laughs> with your counting that you like to do. But is that any use? For the people making the art. Yeah, because I, I was thinking this reminds me of um, uh, juggling patterns mm. when they came up with a notation in the second half of the 20th century. They came up with a notation for juggling patterns. And then suddenly they were able to find new ways of juggling from the notation yes. that they hadn't worked out through throwing balls around. Yeah. And it strikes me as a bit like that because some of these count that you know many um rhyming patterns might be the first three lines rhyme and then the fourth one doesn't yeah. and then it ends and that might not be very satisfying but actually sometimes there have been people who who get very creative by giving themselves what seem like ridiculous constraints mm. yeah yeah so by adding constraints and then exploring what's possible that can give you a a, a new way to be creative and so there was there was this french group mainly French people, called the Oulipo, uh, which stands for, it's short shortening of Ouvoir de Littérature Potentielle. So it's the Workshop of Potential Literature. And they were a mix of kind of mathematicians who love literature, uh, writers who love maths, everything in between. And they produced some really exciting and inventive and creative works of literature based on thinking about new new constraints that could give you new literary forms and you know there were varying levels of success with with what they did but the kind of the highlights really are fantastic and interesting uh, pieces of literature so perhaps the most famous i think uh, work by an Olympian is Georges Perec's novel um which the english translation is a void and in French, it's La Disparition. And this is a novel entirely written without the use of the letter E. So that's kind of, the first thing is clever to do it, but that on its own, I don't think is enough. And this is kind of this question, 
yes, you know, we, we the artifice is impressive, but is it art? And I think in his case, so he produces this entire novel um, without the letter E, but what makes it kind of elevates it to something that's really worth thinking about and reading is because it, it actually follows uh, one of the precepts that the group kind of gave themselves, which is that if we're using a constraint, the work that you create with it should in some way reference that constraint. So it's not just a random bit of text with no E's in it. So this book, it's about something disappearing. The characters know in the book something isn't there. They're trying to work out what it is. There are little clues like um, there's a dictionary with uh, 26 volumes, but volume five is missing. There's a hospital uh, ward where there's no one in bed number five. So there's all these clues that something isn't there. And then the kind of one of the themes of the novel is about loss and absence. And so he he does he doesn't just do it for no reason at all. It's tied in with what's going on in the book. And I think that that is really that's what elevates something. Um, and you can talk about, mm. you know, if you're using these omitted letters. So work like that is called lipograms where you omit mm. one or more letters. And um, they came up with a way of measuring how hard it is to do a particular piece of writing called the lipogrammatic difficulty. So what you do is you, you do a kind of frequency analysis thing. So the letter E is, of course, the most common letter in English. It's even more common in French. So in English, it's sort of 12.7 percent of the letters are E. But in French, it's more like 16 percent. So so you can measure as a kind of rough guide. You look at the length of your text that you're trying to write and then you multiply it by the frequency of the letter or letters that you're omitting. And that gives you some value. And then you can compare. So a very short text um, with only the letter E and no other vowels is actually going to be comparative <laughs> difficulty to a full novel with the letter E, but no other vowels. So the kind of the, the, the inverses of each other. Hmm. And so Georges Perec actually, he wrote, La Disparition was so popular that he wrote then a follow up uh, called Les Revenantes, which only had its only vowel was E. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a lot shorter. Uh, but you, if you work out the lipogrammatic difficulty of doing those two things, only E's or no E's, actually only E's is harder, of course, because, you, you know, you're missing all the other vowels. Mm. And and correspondingly, Les Revenant is much, much shorter. And you can see mathematically why, you know, this is kind of going to have to be the case. So that's sort of interesting. Um, but they, yeah. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to think about how, like... In practice, how difficult this would be. Like, yeah. if you're writing it in English, you can't use the word the. I know. Like, <laughs> it's just like what are, you, what are you even? And in French, you can't have any masculine nouns, right? Because you'd need to mm. put le mm. in front of them. Yeah, so it, and you you use the word five twice, but I guess would they just have used the numeral? Or you mentioned bed number five, and ah, uh, yeah, mm. they might have used. Of course, in French. Hang on, I just uh, yeah, sank. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah you're all right. right. Yeah. You're all right yeah. in French. What? But. You know, this book was translated into mm. English, which is an even, mm. my goodness, <laughs> it's like a doubling. Because with that, yeah, you have to stick to whatever was given to you in the original text and translate yeah. it as closely as possible. Well, so, and, and then bed in French doesn't have an E in it, but bed in English does. So you need like a synonym mm. for bed that you can use. Yes. I guess you could say the fifth, right? Or you can't say the fifth. <laughs> would a, work. A, a fifth? Would. Yeah. <laughs> A fifth yeah. cot. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, English is quite, does have a lot of uh, synonyms in it. We're lucky mm. in English, I think. I mean, that's why crypt yeah. cryptic crosswords work in English. They don't really work yeah. in any other well, language. They, <laughs> this is, for me, this is, I mean, a, a massive cryptic crossword person, but the, there's a whole bunch of interesting maths around, like, the, the, the kind of redundancy in English. Yeah. And it's all kind of information theory, right? Yes. It's about, like, how much information you're communicating with each piece of, of yes. writing that you put down. Um, yeah. But actually, English is kind of just about, right, the, the balance of, of like how many possible words there are is just about right for crosswords because if there were any if, if if every possible combination of letters was a word yes crosswords would be impossible yes but if fewer were possible you wouldn't be able to set the grid yeah. so it's it's actually quite nice that it's balanced for that and it's interesting because in in other languages it's much harder to, to set crosswords and to do cryptic crosswords in particular yeah um, but english is really nice for it yeah yeah so yeah i i feel like it's probably the optimum for crossword setting, <laughs> probably the optimum language, because, yeah, as you say, you've got the right level of redundancy. You have lots of synonyms for things because of, you know, 
we've got all influences from many languages. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't really need to thank English for this. We need to thank all the other languages that thank have done Thank you, any other languages, English, exactly. So, yeah. Th- thank you, everyone who has ever come to England and, and settled here and brought some words with them. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So that structure is kind of the first way <laughs> that mathematics could appear in literature. But then there, there's we could briefly mention kind of the two other things which are sort of linked and I think of it as the increasing visibility of mathematics in a piece of literature so at the very basic level kind of the foundations of your house you've got the structure and what you choose to do Um, and there are examples you know there are books where for instance every chapter is half the length of the one before which is a really cool thing Um, so that's one instant but then the next layer of becoming slightly more visible is in the imagery and the metaphor and the, dare I say, figures of speech. <laughs> I'd like a pun. Uh, because there are lots of writers that really enjoy, you can see it in their writing, they enjoy mathematics and they put they put mathematical imagery into their writing. So Herman Melville, George Eliot, Tolstoy, all of them, James Joyce, they, they just throw little bits of imagery into their writing that is really lovely when you see it. And so that's kind of the, the next stage and then the final stage is where mathematics actually is openly, it's either in the plot or there are mathematician characters. And, you know, writing about mathematics and mathematicians uh, is also something that I talk about and I find very interesting. Everything from, you know, Sherlock Holmes versus Moriarty. And the interesting fact that although Sherlock Holmes is clearly mathematical and does a lot of mathematics and talks about, um, but it's Moriarty, the bad guy, who is explicitly, you know, written as a mathematician? Yeah. And I think that's curious. You know, they're both they're both thinking logically. Mm. Well, I I find that really interesting because Holmes, you always hear about deduction with Sherlock Holmes, but he's not doing yeah. that. He's doing yeah. inductive logic because he's looking yeah. at a bunch of examples and then trying to build a general case. Yes. He's looking at clues and then building the general abstract from that. Whereas what a mathematician yeah. does is starts with some abstract rules and then it, it deducts yeah. rules from that. So I find it very interesting that presumably, um, you know, he was aware of this, <laughs> that, that he's written these two characters to be using very different forms of logic in what they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's it's fascinating in the way he, he talks about, yeah, the use of reason, but then a, a kind of precursor to Holmes um, is in the, you know, short stories of Edgar Allan Poe. And he makes really interesting points about, you know, you can think there's a great passage where he's talking about this person who um, might be a suspect. And he says, um, he, no, we don't think it's him because to be a really great mind, you can't just be a mathematician and you can't just be a poet. You have to be both together. And of course, in my mind, he's not he doesn't really mean hmm. mathematician. What he means is you can't be just good at technical numeracy and you can't uh, neither can you just be good at kind of having wild <laughs> wild crazy thoughts but if you join them together that's where the magic happens you know that, which is true in mathematics mm. um you've got to have a you know be able to think creatively but also to carry that through with with logical thinking and that's what yeah. makes either a great detective or a great master criminal in in the mind of Edgar Allan Poe <laughs> and that's highlighting the problem with the word mathematics and mathematician yes. and things like that yes. isn't it? You, yes. you, you can't be a mathematician as a year nine student would view it yeah. <laughs> you need to be a mathematician as a university student would view it yes. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. quite mm-hmm. they're the same word but they're yeah they're meaning different things aren't they? exactly yeah mm. So can you tell us again about the book, but also uh, if people are interested in you and your work, where, where will they find you? Yes. Yeah, so the book is called Once Upon a Prime, The Wondrous Connections Between Mathematics and Literature. And I'm Sarah Hart. I work at the University of London at Birkbeck College, where I'm a professor in mathematics. And you can follow me on Twitter, if you like, at Sarah Loves Maths. Excellent. We are both also on Twitter. I am at Stex. And that piece of all that the podcast itself is at Maths Objects. And both Peter and I blog at a website called aperiodical.com, which is where you can find more episodes of the podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, if you'd like to suggest an object we might do, or tell us about your favourite example of maths in literature, you can email us at objects at aperiodical.com. The music is Funk Game Loop by Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. Thank you.